I don't know if you've read any of the Harry Potter books or seen the movies, but in the first movie, it was interesting that Harry Potter finds out about a background and a history he didn't know he had about family members he does not remember. And when he is taken to Gringotts Bank, he finds that there is a vault full of gold that has been left for him by his parents. He did not realize that he was rich. We welcome you to our next in our series that I'm calling Let's Look. As I invite us to look into God's word and see what it has to say to help us with our daily lives. In this particular series, we are looking at the book of Ephesians. The theme phrase that I'm using for the book of Ephesians is that we are blessed in Christ to become like Christ. The theme phrase that I'm using is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. If you think about how you might outline the book, there are a couple of different ways that I look at it. One is you can view the first half of the book as the blessings we have in Christ. And the second half of the book is about being like Christ. Or because of the emphasis in the, church, in the book on the role of the church or God's people, the first half of the book is about the purposes of the church, God's people, and the second half is about the practices of God's church. So we are blessed in Christ to be like Christ. Let's take just a moment and highlight the greeting of the book. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, I want us to notice that Paul refers to himself as an apostle. He doesn't do this in all of his letters. The word apostle basically just sent means a messenger or one sent. And so it is used in a general sense of Christian missionaries or messengers who are sent on a particular task. But it's not only used in a wider or generic sense of someone sent for a task or sent as a missionary, but it is used in a narrower sense to refer to people who were handpicked and commissioned and sent forth by Jesus, commonly referred to as the 12 original apostles. You think about Peter, Andrew, James, and John among those 12. Now, Paul would also be called an apostle out of due season. He was an apostle chosen by Jesus. And so you have the word used of people who are chosen as messengers in a general sense, but it's used in a specific sense of those who are handpicked by Jesus to be witnesses of his resurrection. If you want to study that in more detail, you can go to Acts chapter 1 as it talks about the replacing of the apostle Judas, who had betrayed Jesus. And when Peter gives the qualifications for an apostle, he said that that one must be a witness of the life of Jesus from his baptism to his ascension back into heaven so that he can serve as a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says he is an apostle of Jesus by the will of God, that he was chosen by Jesus, by God's will, to be a witness of his resurrection. We can learn in Acts chapter 9 that he was a witness of Jesus. He saw Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection, was therefore qualified to be an apostle. So he's not using it in a wider generic sense, but in a narrow specific sense. He saw the resurrected Lord and was chosen by that Lord to be a witness of Jesus and the resurrection. 
he is citing, writing to the saints who are at Ephesus, literally the holy ones who are at Ephesus, those who are holy. And that's commonly referred as Christians are commonly referred to as saints. A saint is not someone who uh, is a Christian, but then achieves some kind of special secondary status. Saint is a word that's used for all believers in Jesus Christ. We are set aside and called to be holy people. So he's writing to the holy people who are at the city of Ephesus. In our last class, we talked about the city of Ephesus in more detail. You can see it's there located along the coast of what was ancient Asia. This is not modern Asia. This is ancient Asia. It was the largest city in that region, region, we believe between 250 and 300,000 people lived in this city in Paul's day. It was a large cultured city with a thriving economy, and it was known for the temple of the goddess Diana or Artemis. And that great temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, four times larger than the Parthenon in Athens. And Paul traveled here on his second and third missionary journeys. In fact, Paul preached in this city for over two years on one occasion, not counting his other visits to the city. So he writes to the Ephesians uh, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. The phrase in Christ is found 13 times in this particular book and 90 times in the New Testament. But when you combine the equivalent phrases like in him or in Christ Jesus, the various combinations of being in Christ in some way, you will find that it is found 35 times in the book. That Paul in this book is stressing what we have in Christ Jesus. Now he extends to them grace and peace. Now, charis is the word grace, and it is similar to a common greeting in Greek. And so it, many believe that Paul kind of told, chose a word that was special in the Greek culture, and then the word peace, which was special in the Hebrew culture. And since he was writing to Christians from multiple cultures, that's how he would begin his letters. It also may be simply that he used grace and peace because he saw those as cornerstones of the Christian life, that we are saved because of grace, God's favor that he bestows on us that we are unworthy of receiving. And because of that, we are able to have lives of peace and serenity. And so he begins and ends his letters with grace and peace. But now what's unique about the book of Ephesians is not that he just begins the book by extending to them grace and peace, but he continues to talk about those terms throughout the book. The word grace is found 12 times, peace is found eight times. So in the book of Ephesians, grace and peace, they are not just a greeting from Paul, but they are a part of the theme of the book. Now, I like to use the idea of the vault for the first chapter of Ephesians because Paul is stressing what we have in Jesus. Again, it's just a fictitious book, but think about the book, uh, the first Harry Potter book, where Harry Potter finds out he has all this wealth he didn't know he had. It seems to me what Paul is saying is, let me remind you of what you have. Maybe, maybe you forgot what you have. Maybe you never really knew what you have in Jesus Christ, but let me remind you of what you, uh, of what you have. It seems that there was a false teaching behind the book of Colossians and the, behind the book of Ephesians that seemed to question whether Jesus was sufficient or supreme to save us, whether we needed Jesus and something else to truly be saved. And so Paul in these books he seems to be stressing, you just need Jesus. He is all we need. And as he is trying to convince us not to add something else to Jesus or leave Jesus for something else, he at the beginning of this book is reminding us of what we have in Jesus, what we have in our spiritual vault, if you will. So in verses 3 through 14, he is highlighting the blessings that we have because we are redeemed in Christ Jesus. 
Now, I want you to think about the following statement that is believed and followed by many in the religious world. It says, by decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. The message behind this is that God has chosen who will go to heaven and who will go to hell. The idea behind this would be that if God is sovereign, then God cannot do anything because of our actions. Much of what people do in life is determined by their view of God. I had a very good friend who died a few years ago, Loray Rector. I remember one time in a Bible study, he said, nothing determines who you are so much as your view of God. And I think that's very, very true. How we view whether God exists, and if we believe that he exists, how we view the sovereignty of God will determine much of what we believe everywhere else, theologically or religiously. If we believe that God being sovereign or God being the ruler of all things means that he has to push every button, he has to make every single decision, that he cannot any, in any way respond to choices by human beings or actions by human beings, if that's what we believe sovereignty means, then we were, we're going to end up with the definition that's on the screen in front of you. But if we believe that God can sovereign, have sovereign rulership of all that is, but can in his will choose to allow human beings to make choices within parameters that he has decided, then you do not have to end up believing in what is on the screen. But the idea behind this thought is that God is sovereign. He has to make all decisions and push all buttons. And that all human beings are not just bad. We don't just do bad things. We are totally morally depraved. We are so broken spiritually that we cannot under any circumstances without God doing it for us, choose to do what's right and choose to have faith in God. So the idea is that God, that all sin, all Christian or all human beings, excuse me, all human beings are broken and we come into the world spiritually, totally, completely broken and lost forever. And that God has predetermined before we ever drew our first breath, he predetermined that who in the future was going to be born, whoever was born, that he predetermined who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. And that my actions have nothing to do with it. And so if I have faith, it's only because he put, he chose me, he put his Holy Spirit in me, his Holy Spirit made it possible for me to believe, and then I believed. I could not control it. I believe because he gave his spirit and the spirit basically made me believe. And so it's not because of anything I did. It's all because of what he did, and it's all for his glory. So does God predestine people? Well, the answer is going to have to be yes, because you're going to find that term at least six times in the New Testament. The question is not does he predestine or to determine beforehand. It's not does he do that, but it's what does he predetermine beforehand. For example, does he predetermine that individual people by name, individual people will go to heaven or individual people will go to hell? Or does he predestine or predetermine that a certain group will go to heaven and a certain group will go to hell and then we choose which of those groups we're going to be in? So does he predetermine individuals or a group? As we read through Ephesians 3 or Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, think about what you see the text saying. Does the text seem to be emphasizing the choice of individuals or the choice of a group?
in this section, Paul is going to highlight a number of blessings we have in Christ. And while many times in the religious world, we go to this section to talk about predestination, I want us to remember that the, Paul's primary focus is not to push a theory of predestination, whether individual or group. Paul's purpose here is to get the Christians in Ephesus and us as well to realize what we have in Jesus Christ. That's his focus. And we need to be very careful that we don't lose sight, excuse me, we don't lose sight of what Paul's trying to do because of our theological disagreements today. Let's focus on what Paul is saying and what Paul was trying to do. Again, the theme verse that I use for the book is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, I've already noted that when I look at the book of Ephesians, it seems there's a natural division right in the middle of the book. And that the first half of the book focuses on the blessings we have in Christ. So what Paul does in verse 3 is he sets the stage for the discussion or beginning the discussion of the blessings we have in Christ. He says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, the emphasis there is on the totality of it. Remember, it seems that there's some false teaching going on that may have questioned whether Jesus was enough. That Do we need Jesus and something else or someone else? And so Paul says, well, no, every spiritual blessing is found in Jesus. But he also emphasizes in the book this idea of the heavenlies or heavenly places. It's found five times in the book. And he is going to contrast it to the earthlies. And we're really going to need to wrestle with this because later in the book, he's going to talk about forces of evil in heavenly places. And so that may kind of mess with what we think this word means. But what he's stressing is a couple of different areas. The blessings that matter are the heavenly blesses, blessings. And all of those blessings are found in Jesus Christ. So that is what he's, he's wanting to emphasize in what follows. Now, as he began, begins to talk about the blessings we have, he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So, God chose before the foundation of the world. What did he choose? That we would be holy and blameless. Now, Paul, speaking as a Christian to other Christians, says, before the world began, God wanted us to be holy and blameless. God wanted us to live holy and and blameless life. That's what we were chosen for. He then says, in love he predestined us. Now, the phrase in love can apply to the previous statement that he chose us in love to be holy and blameless, or it can mean that he in love predestined us. Neither meaning or neither direction we go in radically changes the meaning here. I tend to view in love as connecting to he predestined us. I want us to emphasize that when Paul first wrote this letter, chapter and verse divisions were not in the original copy of this letter. Those were added hundreds of years later to help us find things. And I'm glad that we added the chapters and verses. It makes, us a lot, it, makes it a lot easier to study our Bible. We just need to remember the chapters and the verse divisions are not inspired by God. They were not a part of the original letter. They are just put there to help us um, find things and tell people where to look for things. And so as I look at in love, I tend to connect the, the phrase in love at the end of verse four to the statement he's making in verse five. And so he's saying in love, he predestined. Prarizo is the word that's used here. It means to decide beforehand or determine beforehand, predetermined. Found six times in the New Testament. In Acts 4.28, it's found in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, and then in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, and later we'll see it again in verse 11. What did God predetermine? He says he predetermined, predetermined us. Notice the plural language throughout this section. He predetermined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Now, I want to talk for a moment. Adoption is very, very special to, to my family. I have three sisters and a brother. Two of my siblings are biological siblings. Two of my siblings are cardiological siblings. They are siblings of the heart. In other words, it doesn't matter if we're connected by blood or not. It doesn't matter to me if we're connected biologically or not. We all love each other and we're all family. So. I have a brother and a sister that became a part of our family through foster care. And my parents were foster parents for many years. And I think I had 14 brothers and sisters who, who came in and out of our home in addition to the three of us who are biologically connected to our parents. And two of those became permanent parts of our family. I also have nieces and nephews on both sides of the family that came became parts of our family through adoption. And so my family on both sides, my wife and I, we, we treasure adoption and we view adoption as something beautiful and wonderful that you know, you're know you willfully choosing somebody to be a part of your family or somebody is willfully choosing you to be a part of their family. It's just a beautiful thing. And it's, it, for me, if you've been adopted, I don't think, I don't, I've not been adopted myself, but I would challenge and say to those of you who are adopted, never feel you should never feel bad about the fact that you were adopted. Somebody wanted you. Somebody treasured you. Somebody loved you. Somebody wanted you as a part of their family. Don't, I would, if, if possible, and I know it's easy for me to say so, uh, but I just want to say, don't focus on the fact that maybe somebody gave you up for adoption. Focus rather on the fact somebody wanted you. And that's what God is saying here. God determined that he wanted to adopt us. He wanted us. He wanted us to be his children. Now, what's interesting is John 3, 16 tells us God loves the whole world. God really wants the whole world to be his. God so loved the world that he gave his son so that the whole world could be in a relationship with him. He says, in love, he predetermined us to adoption as sons through Christ Jesus. So what did he predetermine? That through Christ Jesus, we would be children of God. Now, he says, this is according to his will, the intention of his will, which is kind in its focus, to the praise of the glory of his grace. In kindness, he predetermined that through Christ Jesus, we could be God's children. We could become a part of God's family. And all of this would result in the praise of the glory of his grace, which he bestowed on us in the beloved. Now, the beloved, it's a singular term or a singular word. He's talking about Christ. He's not talking about a group of beloved people. He's talking about a beloved individual. That in the one who's beloved by God, who is that? Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, God has made it possible for us to become a part of God's family, and through that process, his grace is glorified. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Galatians chapter 3, where he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in, in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor freeman. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So he says to the believers, You were unified in Christ and you became children of God in Christ, well, how did you enter into Christ? He says at baptism. He says at baptism, you were baptized into Christ, and in so doing, you were clothed in Christ, and therefore became children of God. Notice the, the word for there, okay? The same word is used in 26, 27, and at the end of verse 28. In other words, you're sons of God, how did you become sons of God? By being baptized into Christ and clothing yourself with Christ. And because of that, you are now unified in Christ. You are one family in Christ. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. 
A third blessing we have is that in him, in Christ, remember this, this phrase or forms, similes of it are found 35 times in this book. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The word redemption, it comes from the word apolutrosis. Apolutrosis. It means redemption, a deliverance that is brought about by the payment of a ransom. And so it is the idea of someone who is enslaved, who is set free because someone pays the price for their freedom. The emphasis in the word is on release and a ransom that is paid. Think about what the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So our freedom was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we've been set free from the sin that enslaves us. But he also says in uh, verse 7 that not only in him we have redemption, he says, but in him we have the forgiveness of our trespasses, which is according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. And I'll, again, before I move forward, I want you to think about the idea of the vault. He's saying here, here, here's the wealth that you and I have in Christ Jesus. Think again of finding that there's a vault somewhere with millions of dollars in it that's for you that you didn't know you have, uh, that you didn't know you had and I didn't know I have. What Paul is saying is God has lavished his riches on us. He has lavished the riches of his grace on us. We are spiritually rich is the idea. And a part of that is that we've been forgiven of our sins. The word offices here, which is translated forgiveness, it's the act of freeing from an obligation, from guilt or punishment. It's the idea of pardon. And the emphasis here is redemption. The word redemption stresses that we're set free from something that enslaves us or imprisons us. The word offices, translated forgiveness, is more, it leans more towards the legal arena and that we have been pardoned from a punishment that we deserve. We've committed a crime. We deserve punishment for that crime, but it's as if the crime disappeared. Therefore, if there is no crime, there is no punishment. So redeemed, we have been set free from what enslaves us. Forgiven, we have been pardoned a crime we committed, we, are, we do not have to face a punishment that we should have had to face. A fifth blessing, he says, is that in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention. Notice the emphasis on the kind intention in the will of God, which he purposed in him or in Christ Jesus. The idea is that God has made known to us a mystery. Now, don't think of mystery in the terms of the clue game, maybe that you played, or at least our family play has played in the past, where you're looking for clues to find out who committed a crime. Think of mystery in terms of something that was not known, but is now being made known. And one thing we see in the New Testament is, especially in the preaching of Paul, is he says, basically, my job is to make known a mystery which not, was not previously known. You might go to Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 and 26, that Paul said basically his ministry, his job, was to tell people about something that previously was not known. And it's, it's wonderful to get to, to get to tell good news. And, and so Paul says, I'm sharing a mystery. I'm sharing with you something that was hidden but is now being revealed. And so God did not have to make this known to us, but one of the blessings we have is he made his kind will known to us. What is that will? That in him, in Christ Jesus, the world and all things can be summed up in Christ and that salvation is available to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. It is a reminder that my personal salvation, that God's will, the word administration, it can be translated as management or stewardship. It's often used with the idea of managing a household. 
You might compare the term in chapter 3, verse 9. You might also compare Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Paul often uses it to refer to his work, where he will say, my stewardship, my management responsibility, my job in the household of God is to make known God's mystery. But here he also seems to be tying in to God's management, that God is at work in the world. God is managing a plan. God has a plan in place, and that plan focuses on filling all things and summing up all things in Jesus Christ. And it's a reminder that God's plan, God's management, God's administration is bigger than just me and my personal salvation, and that it all centers on Jesus Christ. He also says another blessing we have is that we have an inheritance. We're in God's will. We have obtained an inheritance having been predestined, God predetermined according to his purpose, who works all things according to this counsel of his will. So he says we have an, 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 an inheritance, but in, consist, in with that inheritance, God has predestined something. What did God predetermine? To the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. So he says, here's what God predetermined that goes along with the fact that we have an inheritance. God predetermined that those early first believers would in a special way bring about praise of the glory of God. And so it's a powerful statement. Now, as we talk about the inheritance, I want us to go back to Galatians 3. He says we're children of God through faith, and that it's through baptism in the Christ that we clothed ourselves with Christ, and that we become a part of Christ, and therefore that's how we become sons of God through faith. And he says if we're in Christ Jesus, we're one, and he says if we belong to Christ. Now, he's told us in verses 26 and 27 how we become children of God and belong to Christ. And he says, if you belong to Christ, then he says, and, and so if we've done what he talked about in verses 26 and 27, then we do belong to Christ. And he says, if that's the case, then we are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. In Galatians chapter, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter 12, in Genesis chapter 12, God made three promises to Abraham that he would have a great nation in his descendants, they would have their own land, and in him all nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, one of the key ideas in Galatians chapter 3 is that the promise made to Abraham that in him all nations of the earth would be blessed, Galatians 3 is saying that promise is fulfilled in Jesus. And so he says, if we become sons of God through faith expressed in baptism, then we belong to Christ, and we are heirs of the promise God made to Abraham, which means we are blessed through the descendant of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ. So if we're in Christ Jesus, if we were baptized based on faith, then we are heirs of God. Now, along with that, God has predetermined that the first believers in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now, we need to talk about a, a few things here. One of the challenges in Paul's letter is to, to wrestle with how he uses pronouns, because he will, he will go back and forth from first-person singular and plural pronouns to a second and third-person pronouns, etc., and you've got to wrestle with that in all of Paul's letters. It can have a tremendous impact on, on how we translate and un interpret and understand Paul's letters. But here, he has been saying, we, 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 all along. Now, his we references and our references, those first-person plural references throughout the section we've looked at so far in verse 3 through 11, may be referring to those first believers. So he's saying, we first believers, in the context of, Ephes context of Ephesians, it seems it may well be for much of the book, he's talking about the, the first Jewish believers. And he said, and, and here he clearly, in verse 12, is referring to that group. We who were the first to believe. The question is, when he, he 
uses the word we or the word our up to this point, is he talking just about that group? So it's possible that he could be saying all through this, this is what we as first believers have through God uh, or from God through Christ Jesus. And, and would then at this point be summing that up by saying, and along with all these blessings we have at God, in God, he predetermined that we would be to the praise of his glory. And what he would basically be talking about is something that you do see in the New Testament, the idea that those first believers played a special role, especially those first Jewish re believers played a key role in telling the mystery of God to the rest of the world, including those who were not Jews. And they played a, a key role of taking the gospel into non-Jewish parts of the world. And so up to this point, if he's been saying, we have this and we have this, if he's talking about those first Christians, he's not saying that all other Christians don't have those same blessings. It, that What he's stressing here is what all of us have. But what he would be saying is, we have these blessings as Christians, but God had a special purpose in, in mind for us. He predetermined that we would play a special role as first believers, and our special role would be playing a role in a sharing of the mystery with you so that you could have those same blessings from God in Christ Jesus. It also could be that up to this point, when he said, we have these blessings, that he's talking about all Christians, and just here in verse 12, narrows in on the special role that God has in mind for those who were those first Jewish believers. Either way, Paul is saying two things. First of all, he's saying those who believe in Christ Jesus have all these blessings. Second of all, he is saying that those first believers played a key role to God's glory of sharing the, the blessings available in God with the rest of the world. So we have an inheritance. Now, he transitions from the we to the you. He says, in him, you also. So I want us to emphasize, whatever, the, the, he's, whatever group he's talking about when he says we, whether he's talking about we collectively as all believers, or whether he's talking about we referring to those first Christians who let the rest of the world know about Jesus. He's clearly saying to his audience in, in the church at Ephesus, hey, you have the same thing. He says, in him, you also, you also have those blessings. And he says, basically here, let me tell you where those blessings started. You also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the word gospel just means good news. The good news of your salvation or glad tidings. He says, you listen to the message, which is a true message, which is good news. And what's the good news that you can be saved, that we can be saved? He said, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I want us to talk about a couple of words here. I want us to look at the word sealed and the word pledge. Now, the word seal it referred to, it was used with the idea of authentication or security. For example, if a governor or someone in power wanted to send a letter and wanted to assure the person on the other end that it was officially from them, the governor would complete the letter, would fold it over and put wax across the connecting of the fold within that letter and then that governor would take an official ring and stamp it into that wax. Then if the recipient on the other end received it, first of all, the stamp would let the recipient know where it came from because it would have the seal of whoever sent it. And if the seal was broken, then the recipient would know that it's possible that somebody else read it and the message is not secure. So it was used of authentication. It was also used for security purposes. You can think of the story of Jesus and how his tomb was sealed with the, the governor's seal. And so he says, you were sealed. And he says also that seal served as a pledge. The word here translated as pledge in the New American Standard, and that's the translation I'm using here, referred to a promise, a guarantee, or a down payment. 
So think about when you make a down payment on a car, you are saying to that car dealership, I'm giving you this much money now to show you that I have the money to keep giving you more money until I paid off this debt. And so what he says is the Holy Spirit is given to believers as a seal, a authentic authentication, and as a down payment on our inheritance. God is giving us the Spirit, and the fact he's given us the Spirit, it's evident that more is to come. So we are sealed, we are uh, auth we have the the we are authorized authentic members of God's family and because of that we have an inheritance and the Holy Spirit is proof that our inheritance is coming now he says we have this seal I want you to notice the verbs here you have listening and believe both of those are aorist aorist active participles he said you listened and you believed. And then you have sealed, which is an aorist passive indicative uh, verb. So they, we didn't seal ourselves. The sealing was done to us. We were sealed by God. So basically, they, he says, you listen to the, to the message of the gospel. You believe the message, and then God sealed you with his spirit. Now, if we come into the world totally morally depraved, without any ability to believe in God, without God choosing to give us salvation, and without God giving us his Holy Spirit, and then that Holy Spirit allowing slash causing us to have faith, and then we hear the word, and uh, we believe the word, and then we can be saved. If God, if we are all totally morally depraved, and if God predestines individuals for salvation and we have no say in it of our own free will, then the order of the coming of the Holy Spirit must be the Spirit comes first and is given to us by God. Then we hear and then we have faith and we only have faith because God has given us the Holy Spirit that regenerates us prior to hearing the word so that we can have faith. If God predestines individuals, if we are all, if we all come into the world lost and can only be saved uh, by God giving us his spirit prior to hearing the word, then the order of the coming of the spirit has to be spirit, hearing, then faith. That is not the order that Paul describes in Ephesians 1. He says, you heard, then you believed, then you were given the spirit as a seal. Paul says the Spirit is, Paul is saying the Spirit is given as authentication of the fact that you're a believer. It's not given so that the Holy Spirit, he is not given so you become a believer. The Holy Spirit is given to the Christian because he or she is a believer. And that's one of the blessings that he highlights here. So what are the blessings of being in Christ Jesus? We're chosen to be holy, predestined for adoption. We're redeemed, forgiven. God has revealed his mystery to us. We're heirs of God, and we're sealed by his spirit. Why is he doing all of this? Verse 4 of chapter 1, so we would live holy and blameless lives. And then in verse 6, verse 12, and verse 14, to the praise of the glory of his grace. He did all of this so that we would, would be holy people, what God has done for us should drive us to be holy. It shouldn't, we shouldn't take the blessings God has given us and then go live unholy lives. And it also should all result in the glorification of God. If God predestines individuals, then I wonder why we pray for the lost. Because it's already decided for them. Why send the gospel message to the world? Because God's the one that makes the decision. We have no say. Why call on everyone to repent? Because the reality is not everyone can repent. They can only do it if God picks them and gives them the spirit and the spirit makes them repent or at least enables them to do so. The Bible teaches the importance of obedience. The Bible teaches that we will be judged based on our deeds. That's very strange language if in fact my deeds have absolutely nothing to do with my salvation. Now, I understand that some would 
look at this and say, oh, those arguments have been around a long time. I acknowledge that. There's nothing new or fancy about those arguments. But I will say that I have looked at attempt after attempt to refute all of those arguments combined. And I have found none that carried any weight or I have not seen the evidence to change what it seems to me scripture is clearly saying. It is clear that God predestines, but the language of Ephesians is a language that is group language, not individual language. He is talking about what a group, what is that group? Those who are in Christ. It's talking about what those in Christ have because of Jesus. And 11 times you have either in Christ or in him or some form of that just in verses 3 through 14. So what did God predetermine? That those in Christ Jesus would be holy, would be adopted, would be forgiven, would be redeemed, would be to the praise of his glory. The idea that God predestines individuals and not a group, the group that's in Christ, it's going to run, it's going to create collisions with too many other passages that talk about God's love for the whole world. How can he love the whole world if only picks a few to go to heaven? It's going to clash with passages that talk about each of us being judged based on our deeds. The biblical bullseye I would challenge you to hang on to for this lesson is that we've been predestined to praise. That Paul is not only telling us what we have in Christ, but what should result from that. We should live holy lives that bring praise to God. What's in our spiritual vault? We're chosen, we're adopted, we're redeemed, uh, we're forgiven, we're spiritually edu educated on the mystery of God. We are heirs of God sealed by his spirit. All blessings are in Christ. We do not need anyone else. And the result of those blessings should be praise praise from our lives. He blessed us and he wants us to glorify him. I pray that you will continue in this study with us as we continue to focus on the amazing blessings that we have as children of God.